Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Brian Kaplan of George Mason University. He blogs at EconLog, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. Brian, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks so much for having me, Russ. Brian, you approached me uh, recently about doing a podcast on two books that are slightly older than our usual choices. Uh, the first book you recommended is Pictures of the Socialistic Future by Eugene Richter, a book that was written in 1893. It's a dystopian novel. That is, it is a non, the opposite of a utopian novel. It paints a picture of a very uh, unpleasant future uh, that, that would occur in the author's mind under socialism. And the second book, a slightly more well-known, The Road to Serfdom by F.A. Hayek uh, in the news recently. And today uh, is June 22nd, 2010— so uh, we're, that's, the, that's what uh, our recording date. Let's start with talking about Pictures of the Socialistic Future by Eugene Richter. Uh, it's a dystopian novel. It paints, as I said, a very uh, bleak and macabre picture, but it does it in a humorous, almost humorous and ironic way. So tell me about how you found out about that book and your, your thoughts on it. Right. So I heard about this book maybe 20 years ago, I believe, from uh, Ralph Rako, who's an histor historian at uh, SUNY Buffalo. And what he, what he did is he just mentioned that there was this book where bef – that was written bef before, long before the Berlin Wall, where, so where some guy foretold that eventually the socialists would take over Germany and start shooting anyone who tried to flee the country. So I thought that was interesting at the time, but never, never wound up looking into it too much. But then when the anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall was coming along, I wanted to blog on it, and I was thinking, yeah, I would I like to dig up, what is this book exactly, what, you know, like, what's the story with it? And I found not only was the, was the factoid true, not only did Richter write a story where the socialists took over Germany and started shooting people for fleeing the country, but it was actually an amazingly prescient story about what would happen under, uh, under socialism in Germany, written 70 years before the rise of the wall. And we have a version online at the Library of Economics and Liberty we'll put a link up to. Um, without spoiling too much of the plot, the author imagines – the challenges that state socialism would would involve in terms of occupation, savings. Uh, there's a, there's a, again an amusing but not so funny section where, if I remember correctly, the state confiscates or makes uh, worthless all savings accounts because if people accumulate savings, uh, then there's the possibility of exploitation. Because after all, when you have savings, you have capital, and that's the root of capitalism, which is the root of exploitation. Um, what else is in the book that, in terms of the economics, without going into the plot? Well, let's see. The, the most gripping part, as I was mentioning, is that when the socialists take over, be, uh, very quickly, uh, the, 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 so the author, so the narrator is actually uh, you know, basically a rank and file socialist, lifelong socialist. Very so excited getting, about yeah, this yes, revolution. Yes, very, just initially very excited about it and very willing to defend many of, it, many of its more horrible aspects. So, uh, you know, we may, maybe starts having doubts towards, towards, towards the end. But anyway, uh, the thing that's, that's most gripping is that very quickly there's an exodus from Germany, be, and, and the author or the, the narrator explicitly says it's you know, anyone with skills, anyone with ambition wants to get out of Germany. They want to get to Switzerland, they want to get to England, they want to get to America. He says, anywhere where socialism has not taken hold is where people want to go to. And then, uh, almost immediately, the socialist government says that it is illegal to leave the country, and they start and they put up the border guards and they start shooting people who try to flee. And the narrator, very early on in the novel, defends this by saying, "Look, if this were a war, we wouldn't let young men run away from the country and shirk their duties. Now that now this uh, now society is is being run for the benefit of all, we're not going to let uh, talented and ambitious Shirkers. people you know, run run away just because they don't feel like living here anymore." And uh, what's uh, particularly uh, entertaining is his descriptions of some of the so-called efficiencies that the new socialist state puts in place. Uh, there's a, there are cook shops. There's places where mm -hmm. you get your daily meal. Uh, you get, everybody eats the same thing every day for efficiency reasons. The idea being that with these economies of scale, uh, there's going to be a, 
an increase in productivity and produce and wealth mm-hmm. that everyone will be able to enjoy the shorter working hours. And they quickly find, of course, that because of the incentive problems, uh, productivity and wealth actually go down rather dramatically. Uh, yes, that's right. So people stop working very hard under socialism, which, which again, was, a, of course, one of the earliest complaints about socialism, saying, like, under socialism, who's going to do the hard jobs? Who's going to do the unpleasant jobs? Why is anyone going to try any harder than anyone else? But you know, from the point of view of the narrator, much of this is actually positive because it shows that people are people. You've basically taken away the incentive to make the world, un, world unequal. And so, he starts off, as you say, defending it because you know, he says it's a transition period. People mm-hmm. have, have the old habits. Uh, it's it's what I found very very uh, depressing and, and somewhat terrifying about the book, partly because of its ironic and, and semi humorous tone. The, the book it reminded me most of when I was reading it was the Gulag mm-hmm. uh, by – Gulag – Gulag – No, Gulag, the Gulag yes. by the, the Applebaum, Gulag. right? Ian Applebaum's book. Oh, yes, yes, right. Which talks in the, about the early days of socialism, of, of state communism, of their attempts to get people to work uh, hard and how frustrated the mm-hmm. bosses and, and the, the bureaucrats were with people's lethargy. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, it's maybe doubly ironic that when capitalism has – semi-capitalism, some, some form of market process has returned to the Soviet Union. Of course, apologists for capitalism often say, well, has it worked for a while because they've been handicapped by all the, the decades and generations of, of socialism where they've been used to slacking and where corruption is the way that you get ahead. So it's an interesting uh, uh, little bit of deja vu there. Anything else you want to say about the Richter that uh, that you particularly enjoyed or that you think is important? Oh, sure. So what struck me the most is that Richter has his own theory of what went wrong with socialism. So if you step back and you – what, what would go wrong. Of, of, of what, well, <laughs> yes, what would go wrong or what was wrong. I'm not so sure. So this is 18 yeah. – he wrote the yeah. book in 1891. It was translated yes. into English in 1893. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Uh, which is an era we don't really associate with mm-hmm. socialism. Of course, 1848 is really the mm-hmm. point where Europe starts getting interested in mm-hmm. in these ideas. Uh, right. So basically, he, essentially, he's writing the book after the repeal of Bismarck's anti-socialist laws in the German Empire and after the first big electoral breakthrough of the Social Democratic Party of Germany. So you know, essentially, you know, they had been. Uh, Hara- you know, they, were ne- they were never actually banned by, by, by the Kaiser, but they, but they were harassed. And then finally in 1890, the harassing laws were allowed to lapse, and then they had a, a lar- very large jump in their number of seats in Parliament. So I think this is what inspired Richter to say, hey, these guys actually look like they have a real chance of getting power here. But well, you know, anyway, what's striking is that Richter offers a alternative view of what went wrong with socialism or suggests an alternative view of what went wrong with socialism. Uh, what I say in the introduction of the book is that uh, there's you know, one theory that's been very popular for a long time, which is uh, you know, Lord Acton's. Of course, Lord Acton did not survive to see socialism take over, but he has this famous line that all power tends to corrupt and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. So this is one story saying, look, the socialists, they're such wonderful people. They're really nice guys, but power is so corrupting that even these wonderful, noble, charitable, altruistic people, when given power, turn bad. So that's one story that uh, has been told for a very long time. Another one, uh, which, which uh, you know, it's a, you know, to Hayek, or you know, the cha- cha- title of a chapter in Hayek's Road to Serfdom, uh, Why the Worst Get on Top, says, look, it's not so much that it t- makes good people bad, but that the, the, the absolute power or the, or the totalitarian state attracts bad people. It attracts sociopaths, it attracts sadists, because they're the kind of people who, freed of all moral compulsion, uh, can get ahead and 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 are and are actually able to get some semblance of results because once you take away the you know, once you take away financial incentives to do well, then really all that you've got left is the lash. Uh, Richter presents a third, very different story called the born bad story. This is a story that the socialists were never nice people. They were always very. They were always on the edge of the of, 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 of always on the edge of sociopathy, where uh, and, 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 and you know the way he tells the story is that. Uh, the very same people that uh, the very same socialist people were familiar with, uh, these very idealists, uh, basically immediately you hand these these people power, and they're very eager to go and do terrible things. And if you're wondering, like, how does this fit with the ideal with the idealism? A Richter's story is, is basically that they are idealists, but their ideal is totalitarian. Right? They are they are deluded zealots who do who, you know, who, who do sincerely believe in their cause, but their cause is one that from the outset involves doing terrible things to people. 
It's consistent with Lennon. Oh, yes. Um, Castro. Um, people who you could have believed, and many people did believe, were idealists um, and and altruists. Mm-hmm. But in fact, mm-hmm. they were very quick to destroy and, and kill. Mm-hmm. Yes, I mean, it's also important that very often people think, assume that if you're not corrupt, then you're good. Right, so Stalin, for example, uh, by all accounts that I've ever read, lived an extremely modest life. Correct. He's basically slept on a cot in some crummy room, uh, in the, and yet he murdered millions of people. And so you, you, you might look at him and say, well, you know, he's, he, he's so hard on himself, he must be a nice guy. And not necessarily. There's, there's another possibility that okay. someone is a violent zealot who, on the one hand, is not about uh, giving a comfortable life to themselves, but on the other hand, is, you know, is more than willing to do enjoys, terrible things to others. enjoys running other people's lives to a yes. rather uh, pathological extreme. Um, well, you know, a long time ago, uh, we did a podcast with Bruce Blaine and a Mesquita about King Leopold. Hmm. And Bruce raised the observation that uh, King Leopold in Belgium is a very respected leader uh, under the pressure from the parliament of its day. Belgium enacted a lot of social legislation. was very popular. And King Leopold, either under duress from that mm-hmm. legislature, legislature or because he maybe thought it was a good idea, went along with it. And he, as a result, is a popular figure in Belgium. In the Belgian Congo, he's less popular where he <laughs> basically used it as his personal fiefdom, murdered hundreds of thousands, maybe millions through his, his agents and extracted a lot of wealth from it. And Bruce raised the question in that podcast, who's the real King Leopold? And concluded, as, as I do, that, well, it'd be the one where he had no constraints. In the Belgian Congo, he was free to do whatever he wanted, and he was a despot of, of the worst kind. Is there any person in human history who has had something close to absolute power who has not been a despot? Now, we use the phrase mm-hmm. in, in economics and in casual conversation – a benign dictator, mm-hmm. right? Benign, mm-hmm. I think is the word, right? Mm-hmm. Not not gloriously loving, mm-hmm. benign. I don't think there's a benign dictator in history. Can you think of one? That is, all the leaders that I can think of who have had something close to what, we, what Lord Acton would call absolute power were corrupted beyond, beyond words. Is there an exception? Am I suffering from confirmation bias here? It's a really tough question, Russ. Well, it's a big I, I, universe to think yes, about. Yes, I'd want, I'd want to think about it for quite a while. Uh, you know, Gordon Tullock tells you know, some very interesting stories about the transition from absolute monarchy to parliamentary monarchy in uh, 19th century Europe. And his story, uh, which I, I think you know, a lot of it I actually got from him uh, per, in person rather than, his, rather than the writings, is that – uh, precisely because these were hereditary monarchies, where there was no real competition to get to the throne, eventually, just by luck, you wind up getting got, wind up getting some people who are not very power hungry, and then were willing to voluntarily sign away their power. Now, you might say, probably by that point, they weren't really absolute monarchs anyway. Even if by law they were, in practice, they probably were not. But uh, but uh, still, I mean, if I if I were, if I were looking, I would probably go and t- you know take a look at some of these transitions from at least official absolute monarchy to you know to parliamentary governments and see quite what, quite what's going on. It did you know, the you know, Tullock story does make a lot of sense to me that in a modern dictatorship where you have to fight to get to the top, you to kill you, you know, you're, you're, the people at the top are always very power hungry. Whereas in a hereditary one, you actually do eventually have a chance of just getting lucky and you have someone who doesn't really want to be in charge and wants people to like him. I mean, the other thing about the interesting about the, the King Leopold situation is that uh, one very common dividing line that people make between sociopaths and simple murderers is that a sociopath doesn't mind doing horrible things to people that are very personally well known to him. Uh huh. So, I mean, and this, this is the sense in which I'd say, you know, Stalin was a sociopath. Hitler really was not. Stalin actually enjoyed putting the wives and, and wives of people that he worked with in prison yeah. and then continued <laughs> working with them. Hitler actually, while he was willing to murder millions of strangers, when he had to do things to people that he personally knew, he really had to work himself up, actually. Like when, when there was the, uh, you know, the, the, the decision made to kill Ernst Röhm, he, by, by the accounts that I've read, actually spent, spent, spent several hours trying to convince himself that it would be all right and that it wasn't really, that he was, that it was, that it, that it, and I think the same thing probably goes with King Leopold, where as a Belgian, he probably felt like, much like these Belgians are kind of like my people, whereas to go and kill a million people, you know, thousands of miles away that he's never seen, 
Yeah. Uh, there's you know, much easier for a person that you wouldn't think of as a monster if you met them, and yet uh, they very well may be yeah. a monster. It's, Correct. Yeah. Uh, okay, so back. To, sorry for that digression. But let's let's go back to the the rector. So we've got he he's got a theory of of who would be in charge uh, in that situation, who would be on top. The mm-hmm. Hayekian question. Uh, what I think is fascinating about both books, uh, the Richter and the Hayek, that I think the average person, certainly I wasn't as uh, aware of, having not read the Hayek in about 30 years, is you forget the emphasis on Germany. Mm -hmm. So the Richter book is, you know, we think of Germany from 1870 onward as as a, you know, Mm Prussian-oriented, militaristic uh, world, dominated in the early part by Bismarck uh, in terms of diplomacy and, and design. It's well known, I think, by most folks that Bismarck pushed so-called liberal or socialistic policies such mm-hmm. as yes, social security. Right. Conservative socialism is what they call it. Yes, accident, accident insurance was actually probably the bigger deal at the time. And I, I think the judgment of most historians is that he did that for, uh, for pure pragmatism. Mm-hmm. But and yet but, they often add, and it took other and it took other other so-called civilized countries decades to get decades to catch, to catch, to catch up to what Bismarck, the conservative correct. socialist, uh, did in his great far-seeing statesmanly. Yeah, right? yeah. In, in, this again would be in the eighteen seventy to nineteen hundred period, mm-hmm. roughly. Mm-hmm. So, what, what's interesting about that for me, and, and Hayek also uh, deliberately avoids talking about the Soviet Union. The book was written. Mm. In uh, 1944, in the middle of World War II, mm-hmm. when the Soviet Union was our ally, uh, mm-hmm. Britain and England, who he was directing his book toward, and he deliberately chose uh, Germany mm-hmm. as his model because – for two reasons. One was that Germany was our enemy and he was mm-hmm. worried about this paradoxical result that we were fighting Germany but we were adopting many of its goals, he feared. Mm-hmm. Or method, uh, methods anyway. And methods, yes. correct. And the second is that – he argues in the book that the roots of of Nazism, uh, of course, are German, mm-hmm. and that many of the intellectual ideas that paved the way for Nazism were becoming quite uh, adopt easily adopted and believed in by by many Americans and and, and English. Yes, I mean Germany really is the root of all of this. So it, it's easy to forget that Karl Marx was a German, yep. uh, even though you know did most did most of his writing in England. Uh, easy to forget that the first real socialist party was the so, you know, was the Social Democratic Party of Germany, and also uh, you know it's it's almost hard to you know, to imagine, but uh, the truth is that before the the split of the Russian socialists into the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, they were they they, they were the Russian Social Democratic Party. Right. So while today we think of social democracy as being the, the, as, yes, and, and as being the alternative to 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 to, to, Mar- to Marxism, Leninism, or, or or to communism, actually the original name of the party that Lenin belonged to was this 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 R- Russian Social Democratic Party, which was essentially a Russian imitator of what they were doing in Germany. So the question I have for for Richter and Hayek, you know, both of them are, are worried about what I would call state socialism, not what we would call uh, the mixed. Uh, mm-hmm. Economy of today, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In the, you know, in the so-called mixed economy of, let's say, fair elements, you have regulation of various kinds, mm-hmm. but you don't have the, the heaviest hand of government. You don't mm-hmm. have government assigning people to occupations, setting mm-hmm. all prices, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there any? Uh, did the Nazis do that? My, my impression, the general impression, is yes, the communists they tried to run the whole economy from the top mm-hmm. down. Mm-hmm. The Nazis, I think, the general view is well, true. They were the National Socialists. That's mm-hmm. their. That's what Nazi comes from. But did they run the economy in any sense? I would say that they did. So here's the best way to think about it. After World War One, the Social Democratic Party of Germany split into two factions. One became the Communist Party, and the other other became uh, the other is basically the ancestor of the Social Democratic Party as we now know it. But it was still a Marxist party. Both factions were still a Mar- Marxist party. And what they did is there was a very large expansion of the role of government in Germany in the twenties uh, under under the Social Democratic Party of Germany. And then when the Nazis took over, they took that very large and uh, very, very very large government, which was seen by everyone at the time as being well on its way to socialism, and they added more socialism. So uh, again, it was not it was not uh, you know, all the way to socialism, but 
Uh, you know, there, there, but basically, there had been a very large expansion in the role of the state under the Social Democrats, and the Nazis took that and extended it further. Uh, the main difference, really, between the uh, you know, the, you know, both the, you know, the German Social Democrats and the Nazis and the actual communists was primarily in agriculture. What are you going? What are you going to do with agriculture? What the Social Democrats and the Nazis decided is we're not going to take the peasants' land away from them because it didn't work out very well when when Lenin tried it and then when Stalin actually actually went ahead and really did it. Uh, because there was this massive decline in productivity. In terms of industry, uh, there, uh, there, there was not a total takeover uh, you know, under the Social Democrats or the Nazis in Germany, but there was a big expansion, and the Nazis expanded it further. So there was, uh, particularly in, in the defense industry, there were new industries built up, new, new government-owned in- industries and, uh, you know, and firms built up. Uh, and, but you know, but the, the way that it's more, more often described is that um, see this. Uh, this may, may be apocryphal, but th- this basically comes from an interview with uh, a guy named Hermann Rauschning, uh, who uh, wrote a book called Hitler Speaks. He, you know, he was basically a former Nazi who at least claimed to have these very lengthy conversations with Hitler, and then wrote them up. Uh, you know, wrote them up afterwards. And the, the the line that you get from Hitler is pretty much, "Look, we don't need to take your cow because uh, as long as we own you." Right, so uh, you know, who, ca- who cares? Who cares about whether or not we actually own the firm and name? As long as we actually have complete control over the people running it, uh, that's good enough. Yeah. So, I think the, the the point you make, I think that's particularly important, is the you know, from from thirty three onward when Hitler took took power, uh, the proportion of the economy devoted to the military mm-hmm. must have grown quite dramatically. Yes. I don't have those numbers obviously in front of me, but mm-hmm. but Hitler was essential. My, my guess is is that Germany was in a wartime economy mm-hmm. from close to thirty three on, mm-hmm. and with a lot of top down control. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, incidentally, I would say the same about the Soviet Union too. Right. Uh, so. Uh, you know, when we talk about Soviet industrialization, so much of it was geared towards the military that I think a really a better term is actually militarization, uh-huh. where it's more about building up a modern a modern army than it is about building up a modern economy where you find what people want and give them more of that stuff. Right. This the sort of textbook idea mm-hmm. that we're going to have to figure out how many blue hats and how many mm-hmm. green shirts mm-hmm. and how many cars of this size. Uh, that was really secondary to the guns. Yes. Yes. Um, and of course, there was a lot of corporate capitalism going on there. To the mm-hmm. extent there was capitalism, mm-hmm. uh, probably again, I don't know this. I'd love for someone with more historical background to weigh in in the comments, or maybe you know Brian. But certainly, the the large industrial families of, mm-hmm. of Germany, the Krupps, mm-hmm. uh, in the weapons industry. I, mm-hmm. I don't know who ran the steel business, but I'm sure it mm-hmm. wasn't exactly a highly competitive industry, mm-hmm. and there probably was a lot of government involvement. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely one where if you wanted to stay in business at all, you needed to be very good friends with the Nazis. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then I think you're mentioning price controls too. So you know, there are very extensive price controls. Uh, you know, in, in Nazi Germany, uh, there's a very good book called uh, Hitler's Social Revolution that goes into not only Nazi social programs, but also into you know, price controls and other regulations that were that were in place. So again, you know, the, the best way of thinking about it is that social democrats took Germany quite quite far on the way to socialism, and then the Nazis, rather than reversing this, extended it further. Right, and the irony, of course, is that people think the Nazis they're right wing, mm-hmm. communists are left wing. So right wingers mm-hmm. they're going to be free market, but of course mm-hmm. they weren't. They were socialists. Yes, I mean again, really the difference in German politics between right and left wingers wasn't so much about the role of government, but about the role of the nation. Okay, so the, you know the, the big the big split and and the, uh, what, re- what really upset the Nazis about the socialists wasn't the socialism but it was the internationalism was saying you know, workers of all nations are brothers and they should rise up against the ruling classes, and the Nazi message no no Germans of all classes are brothers and we should b- band together against other nations yeah yeah um, and don't tell me we fought World War One for nothing <laughs> yeah right um, which they did but <laughs> that yes. was not yes. we all did their, unfortunately their message, everybody their did it was. Really, a, a rather distressing, um, distressing thing. Um, I, I wonder about entrepreneurship. Uh, one of the measures you might think of of private enterprise that might still persist in in these situations is the ability to op- to start a business, mm-hmm. to innovate. Uh, you know, we have Schumpeter with the idea of creative destruction. It's in many ways the opposite of a top-down approach. It's the Mm bottom-up innovations that determine if they can persist and if they can get funding and if they can make customers happy, they can knock out their competitors. Um, In Certainly in communism, communist Russia, Mm -hmm. starting a business was uh, (laughs) – had to be a black market activity. Mm 
an underground activity. And of course, there was, I'm sure, yes, a great uh, deal I, of it. You basically, there, there was this little net period, but uh, yes, essentially, you're right. And I wonder what it was like in Nazi Germany. I don't know. I mean, again, as far as, far as I understand, uh, you could, you know, like, again, as long as you were not a Jew, and Jews were one of the most entrepreneurial gr- uh, groups in Germany, but as long as you were not a Jew, you could still start a business and there was still bankruptcy. A lot of the Nazi program was basically protecting failed, outmoded business models from competition, though. So if you go and read the original Nazi platform, there, was, there were uh, planks against department stores, chain stores. Uh, you could say the Nazis were sort of the original anti-Walmart movement, if you want to be provocative. Uh, Which you would like to be, Brian. <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? Why <laughs> not? Uh, so, and uh, when they actually got in power, they didn't go, they didn't go all the way towards shutting them down, unless, unless of course, they were Jewish stores, uh, in which case they might get shut down or, 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 or taken over. They're not going to let Jews keep, uh, keep competing good Germans into the ground. Uh, but there were a number of penalties and taxes and other uh, and other other things to try to keep your old your old your old mom and pop stores afloat uh, in the face of uh, you know, basically competition from from uh, big business and retail. I want to turn to Hayek for a minute. We'll mm-hmm. move more in that direction. Um, one of the themes of the Road to Serfdom, which I had forgotten, which is it really runs runs through the book, is competition. Mm-hmm. Um, he really sees. If you had to sum up his view of the alternatives, um, it, you know, it's, Friedman is, is is free to choose. Uh, Hayek would say, but if there's not a lot of choices, it's not the power of free to choose is not as important. And so for him, mm-hmm. the alternative to socialism was very much the free to, freedom to choose, freedom to choose who you bought from, freedom to choose at the a competition among people trying to make you happy, uh, competition setting prices, competition giving you alternative places to work. And he saw socialism uh, clearly as a monopoly, mm-hmm. as, a, mm-hmm. as a state <clears throat> control of who you worked for, how much you got paid, and what your choices were. Uh, yeah, the, yes, I say that seems right. And I think you know, Hayek also you know, seems very concerned about lack of political competition under socialism as well. So you know, the one-party state uh, you know, yeah. he sees as a great way to make sure that, bad, that you get bad policies and keep them. So let's turn to the road to serfdom, which often gets parodied, and Hayek was very upset about this, uh, as, well, if you take the first step towards socialism, uh, it's inevitable that we'll turn mm-hmm. toward a totalitarian, a totalitarian state. That was not what he said, though. Uh, yeah, basically, basically that's so. I mean, I think there, there's, there's sometimes in Hayek there are sentences that contradict the general thesis. Uh, he's not someone who tries to make sure that every sentence is uh, perfectly consistent with every other sentence in the book. Uh, just uh, to be, uh, again, just just to be honest about that. But yes, I mean, certainly overall, he's you know, he tries to avoid making hyperbolic claims about how like you know some small amount of socialism is going to send us straight to totalitarianism. But I think I think he, but he still you know, he is concerned about maybe not a super slippery slope, but a moderately slippery slope, where once you start going, if you don't make an effort to stop, if you don't say, look, we're going too far here, we don't want to get, we don't want any more socialism. This then you may indeed eventually fall off the roof. So the question I want to ask is, you know, a lot of people say, well, he was wrong because we haven't we haven't gone to socialism mm-hmm. and Hayek's counter, which I think he explicitly says in his. Some of the forwards he wrote later on in the in different the 1976 edition, um, he said, "Well, yeah, I was right because if people listened, not necessarily to him, but to other people worried about socialism, and we drew back." Um, what's your assessment of how we've done? We being, let's say, England, the United States. Certainly, England after the war went toward a very socialist. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Path for you could say two and a half decades uh, certainly has moved somewhat away from that. Mm-hmm. The United States never went quite so far, but we seem to be. I worry that we're dying the death of a thousand cuts. Um, what do you think? Right in 1945, if I had been alive, I would have been worried, very worried about the future of mankind, and I am not a worrier. I, mean, I say that you know, in, by 1945, mankind was up to the edge of the abyss, and the question is, are we going to jump in or not? I could easily have seen things having, you know, turning into the world of 1984 with you know, nuclear war, you know, destroying the last remnants of of you know, the beautiful civilization that we took, that we take for granted, and basically mankind pulled back from the abyss. They managed to avoid you know, mutual nuclear annihilation, and they also managed in the Western world to avoid going down this totalitarian route and becoming uh, you know, like like the Soviets or like, or like the Nazis. So, I mean, I, and I, I think you know, a lot of it is that. Uh, while the official ideology was one where it seemed like socialism was the way to, the, way to the go, common sense got in the way. 
right? And when it seemed like you had to choose between, you know, like, you know, going further towards socialism or doing something truly awful, you know, said, all right, well, okay, I guess we don't really need to go, you know, to go as far as, as it seems. Uh, what's, what's really striking to me is I was reading a lot, I've been reading a lot about the history of German socialism lately. So I was curious about, you know, when exactly was it that the moderate faction of the German social democrats, uh, the, that's the, that's basically, basically the communists split off from them, leaving this moderate group, but they were still Marxists. You know, what exactly happened to them? And basically in the late 50s, they wrote a new platform. Uh, let's see, the, the name of it uh, escapes me right now. But basically they wrote a new platform, essentially renouncing Marxism, saying that they, fa- saying that they favored a, 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 competitive, uh, a competitive, moderately free market economy. And for the descendants of... Of you know of August Bebel and uh, Liebknecht, uh, you know the, the the original leaders of of the German Social Democratic Party to say these things was was, was huge, and, and it basically came from having you know like you know communism and half a German you know, you know in, in in one in the eastern East Germany seeing how awful it was and saying look we don't want that and we're also going to make sure that we don't go there we're going to put fences around uh, fences around the possibility that we might get there so if it, st- it starts to look like we're in danger going there we're not going to do it. Right. So I think really what happened is common sense prevailed and held off, you know, the truly the truly awful things from happening. And then finally, uh, the most awful things, uh, you know, behind the behind the Iron Curtain, uh, just collapsed to their own accord without war. And that, uh, that I think that really did a lot to, uh, you know, to put the final nail in the coffin of you know, like, are we actually going to go there? Um, you know, Jim Buchanan, our colleague here at George Mason, in a recent talk, and he's probably written this as well, but a recent talk, he said, you know, I'm a when I look to the future, I'm a pessimist. When I look to the past, I'm an optimist. So mm-hmm. I'm scared right now, he said. Mm-hmm. Of course, you look at the past, there's a lot of times you would have been scared, yes. 1945 being being one of them. Uh, you know, the standard view, which I'm not sure if it's true, but it's interesting that you know, America could have gone the way of, of fascism, mm-hmm. that FDR certainly was mm-hmm. more state control than America had been used to, but he did it mm-hmm. in a moderate way, whether it was – Mm-hmm. Along with what he wanted, or whether mm-hmm. what he was forced to do, of course, right. moderate way, but you know, also with many legislative time bombs, where the origin, the initial impact of Social Security was trivial, correct, and yet, uh, you know, sixty years later, uh, it has an enormous effect. So I'd add Fannie Mae yes. to that, which he yeah. established in 1938. I didn't know that, Russ. Which he was against, yeah. actually, yeah. when he was governor. Yeah. He said it was it would it was a bad idea. He actually was against the FDIC mm. when he was governor because he said, hey, if we guarantee stuff, people are going to get reckless. Uh, but, he, but he put in Fannie Mae because the housing market was struggling so much. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be talking about that soon. Uh, again, we're going to come back to this issue mm-hmm. with, with a, in a podcast, I hope, with Arnold Kling. But that was 1938, so – Seventy years later, it blows up and it costs the American people three hundred plus billion on its way to mm-hmm. a number we're not we're not quite sure of. Um, so that that is one way to look at it is the is the, is the time bomb approach. Mm-hmm. What I was going to say is, you know, we did a podcast last week with Scott Sumner. Scott argues that from nineteen eighty on, the world became more liberal in the classical sense: more private property, mm-hmm. less mm-hmm. nationalization, lower tax rates, although not necessarily lower taxes. Although in some places, mm-hmm. yes. So, you know, in Scott's world, the glass is half full. Mm-hmm. When I look at the United States, I, I United States, I, I agree with him. Outside the United States, outside the United States, the world looked at. I don't think it's just common sense. The world looked at the data. They Mm -hmm. saw what it was like in East Germany compared to West Germany. Mm -hmm. They had a a remarkable social experiment there, and the evidence was overwhelming. You couldn't – there's no regression Mm -hmm. you could run. There's nothing you could slip into the right-hand side of the equation and come to the conclusion that socialism was was a great system. Not only was it not delivering the goods, it was an appalling non-economic experiment uh, in the form of communism. So – you could argue that from the 80s on, as the wall fell and as people saw that evidence, that this whole debate about government control, is it's over. We won, we being the, pe- the, the mm-hmm. people in favor of freedom. The idea of state control that Richter and Hayek were worrying about and that Milton Friedman worries about in the first chapter of Capitalism and Freedom, very Hayekian chapter where he talks about the inability of economic uh, mm-hmm. freedom to coexist with politi- uh, economic freedom to exist with political non-freedom and vice versa. Um, so it's over. It's an historical episode between 1850 and 1950. The world looked at this. It was appealing on paper, and um, but it's over. Is it over? Well, let's see. Uh, history lasts a long time. So. Yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, what I'd say is that uh, – 
when people, you know, like for generations that actually lived through it, uh, it's very unlikely you'll ever, pers- you'll ever change their minds that, it, that actually you know, what, what they saw with their own eyes was terrible was actually good. But uh, you know, eventually those people, you know, those people die, and the next generation has, has only hears about this in books. And you know, who knows what's, what, what's really going on in books. If they don't see it with their own eyes. They're all, they often have a very different attitude. And I think that, that is part of what's going on now is that there's many people you know, you know, in, in the United States now who vote who just have no memory of what socialism was like. So when you go and say that we might be going down this road, and then they say, well, what's so bad about that road? Maybe we should go down that road. It sounds nice, right? And what's so bad about it? Oh, the, it was tried some other place, some other time. Well, we'll run know. it better, or yeah. people will be nicer. Run it better, or yeah, people will be nicer. You know, you know, those, right. you know, like of course, of course, the Russians are going to be that way, but uh, right, not yeah, us. Not we us. wouldn't. We'd be yes. And do you think there's any evidence in recent? Let me ask a question differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, we could think of a couple different ways to think about top-down government involvement. We could think about the size of government, mm-hmm. just in the absolute dollar sense. We could think about the regulatory mm-hmm. uh, influence of the government through direct regulation, the nanny state, and so on. And we could think about the social uh, welfare, the the mm-hmm. um, the things that, that people spend money on that are um, to reduce the amount of risk and variance in life due to either bad luck or other other reasons. Mm-hmm. So if you look at, say, Scandinavia, which I think a lot of Americans associate with, with social democracy, mm-hmm. as Scott Sumner has argued, and I think a lot of people agree, they have a lot of social welfare spending, mm-hmm. but they have a lot of mm-hmm. free market mm-hmm. enterprise opportunities mm-hmm. there. Um, I'm not sure how great they are. I raised the question of when you have high tax rates, it's mm-hmm. it's hard to generate venture capital industry and the the underpinnings of, of entrepreneurship, perhaps. But mm-hmm. I don't know if that's true. So you know, there are all these different ways to to measure you know, how how free or non free an economy is. Using those measures, either the size of government, the regulatory influence of government, or this amount of social welfare spending, how would you assess the trend line? either in America or the rest of the world. Hmm. Well, I mean, America, you know, certainly for the social welfare spending, the trend line is way up just for demographic reasons. And then on top of that, the new programs have been adopted that are, gonna, that are compounding this problem. Uh, so I mean, in, terms of social, in terms of social welfare spending, uh, government is definitely going to get bigger unless there's some major effort made to stop it from getting bigger. Right? And right now, actually, we've made, the, the changes in legislation are amplifying rather than, uh, rather than dampening the, the, these demographic effects. Uh, for, you know, for actual direct government ownership, that I don't I, I don't see much much change there. I think what, what you do have more. Oh, is, we have some short run yeah, yes. change. We yeah, have government yeah, owning yeah. the car industry and part yeah. of the financial right, industry yeah, yes. and part of the car industry, part of the financial industry. I don't perceive that as a long term yes. problem, but it hasn't gone away yet. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, again, again, it may wind up lasting, but you know, as a percentage of GDP, I don't, uh, again, it's, that still probably isn't going to be enormous. Uh, but what what I rather see is the. Uh, is the implicit ownership of government, where you know, you know, government may say General, General Motors, is the auto industry, the private property again, but in practice, they may have become so entangled and so dependent upon government to help them that they pretty much wind up acting like a state industry. So, and I, I think that 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 is more that is more of a danger that we'll have de facto private property, and yet the government will be not a silent partner, but a quite active partner. Uh, you know, saying, look, you know, in the past, you've you've always come running to me, so now that you're doing okay, you're going to you're you're going to need to. Have a, have a listen at what I have to say, or maybe you know do do exactly what I say, and then and then in terms of, in terms of let's see you had you had one other measure so you had well you break the so 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 you know total government again just just given the the you know the social welfare spending that I think that's that's that's, yeah, definitely that's going to go up the regulatory one is interesting because there was a uh, you know extensive extensive deregulation of of you know what economists often call economic regulation you know price and entry in a lot of industries but there's been a big rise in environmental regulation. So, and, 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 labor, I, I, uh, yes, and other kinds, yes. labor market the, regulation. I mean, with labor market, it's more about lawsuits rather than regulation uh, per se. But yeah, so it's more more about ability, you know, like making it easier for workers to sue, uh, and and also making it more likely that in fact a lawsuit will 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 succeed. Uh, but I mean, there, you know, again, there, of course, there, there, there's some labor regulation, but I see it more as be, more as being in the in the courts and the threat of taking your employer to court. I just have a feeling that the amount of paperwork. Again, I haven't mm-hmm. seen any firm evidence on this, but I, my my impression is that it's harder to start a business now than it was 25 years mm-hmm. ago, 40 years ago. Um, 
that has employees. It's very e- – what's great mm-hmm. is it's easier to start your own business, mm-hmm. much easier, mainly for mm-hmm. technological reasons, not for re- some reduction mm-hmm. in regulation. The, the internet and the nature of our economy has changed. You don't, you don't have to th- – there's tremendous opportunities for, for self-employment that weren't available 25 years ago because of the internet. Uh, and that's all good, but uh, we're, we're offsetting it somewhat if, mm-hmm. uh, if you want to have employees and to be a going con- so-called going concern. Uh, right, I think that's right. Although, again, uh, the, the you know the division between formal regulation and as soon as you start hiring people, you have to start worrying about getting sued. I tend to think that it's more the second. That's interesting. I don't think yeah. about that. I'll, I'll have to think about yeah, that. I mean, you know, certainly, like a lot of the paperwork you would keep in your uh, in your human relations uh, division is about making sure that you that you can defend yourself if well, you get sued. True. And uh, but some yeah. of it, I think, yeah. is compliance. Of course, yeah. what's happened with compliance is it's there's specialization. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot of uh, consultants mm-hmm. who will do your Sarbanes-Oxley right, right. compliance work for you. What it's really done, I think, of the, you know, over the last 20 years is made it easier for large companies to avoid competition because they can outsource mm-hmm. a lot of these costs and see it just as overhead – Mm-hmm. A fixed cost that their mm-hmm. size can absorb, whereas smaller companies can't do that. Uh, yeah, that's right. So, I mean, whenever I'm teaching industrial organization, uh, which is the area of economics that, that looks at this kind of thing, I'm always struck by how uh, if you want to have a large number of small firms, uh, the worst thing that you can do is to impose a, re- a fixed regulatory cost where every, basically if you want to be in business, you need to pay $100,000 worth of expenses no matter right. how big or how small you are because then uh, basically, what the, basically what the winds up doing is increasing the size and reducing the number of firms that can actually stay alive in the market. Certainly that's true of FDA regulation. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want to be a pharmaceutical yeah. company, you've you got to be a lar- very large firm because yes. you have to absorb those, those costs yeah, yeah. Of, of compliance. Absolutely. Um, there are some small firms, but they're not in the manufacturing business. Mm-hmm. They're sort of in the idea business. Those get purchased by the larger firms. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, bring, which brings us back to Hayek. Hayek was very worried about competition and was willing to see some. Uh, I just want to emphasize important. He's he's, he's not an anarchist. Uh, I'm not an anarchist either, Brian. You're probably a clip more of an anarchist than I am. But Hayek certainly, in the road to serfdom, uh, is willing to see government involvement in anti-pollution. Uh, places where there's public ex- externalities like that, um, and he's even willing to see, to stomach government in policy and regulation to increase competition if it could do so, mm-hmm. as opposed to the alternative, which it mm-hmm. often which it often does. Mm-hmm. So it's an interesting question of right. But as far as I remember, he does not push the line that in fact it doesn't. He you know I mean either remains more correct. yeah either, either is more agnostic or actually sounds uh, fairly fairly supportive. Although I don't remember uh, the book's a th- in some ways it's a theoretical treatise in that way right. He says mm-hmm. it's imaginable that government could mm-hmm. uh, do this and do it better than it's doing now. We, we could imagine that, but that's the appropriate role for government and not uh, in the shouldn't be in the job of steering people or steering resources toward the common good. Um, you know one of the things I find that's striking about the book. So even though even though socialism, state socialism, I think is not very attractive to most people. And I, even though I worry about it, I do think there's been a tremendous backlash against mm-hmm. the increases in government control recently. Mm-hmm. Um, the romance of socialism is very much alive mm-hmm. in, in the modern world. And, and at one point, Hayek says, we're all socialists now. Mm-hmm. And I think that's very much the case politically. Uh, very difficult for a politician to say – well, this isn't perfect, but it's better this than trying to to make it perfect. You know, there's some market outcome. Um, there's a lot of nice uh, examples of the book where Hayek will, will say, you know, under this private market-oriented solution, it's not ideal, but it beats the alternative. And and most politicians find it ever, very difficult to to avoid the temptation to quote make it better with some legislative solution. Right. I mean, I'd say that I mean, there probably are a lot of politicians who. In their hearts, do think that, but it's just not a rhetorically very good case. So what they what they want to do is basically go and point fingers at some other distracting issue in order to get attention off the area where they they know like as long as people are paying attention to this, something bad is likely to be done. Uh, so I mean here here I mean I've I've often been struck by like, you know, one, like one of the most effective ways to argue against doing something about global warming is to say other countries aren't doing as much. Right, and, that, and again, if you if you thought if you thought that doing something about global warming was a bad idea, it seems more rhetorically effective uh, in politics 
uh, to say China isn't doing its fair share than to say this won't do, this is going to cost a whole, a whole lot of money and won't do very much. So you're saying if you want to – for the politician who doesn't want to do anything, mm-hmm. he's going to blame the nations that aren't doing anything. Yes. I mean so that, that's, that's one very effective tactic. Uh, so we're, I mean, it's I, a fairness I, argument. Yeah, right? yeah it's a fair, fair, fairness argument and just uh, you know, basically sort of like dodge, you know, you know, dodging the main issue and then raising some, dis- some, some distractor issue. And uh, this, this is the kind of thing where when I'm watching, I very often say, wow, it's pretty obvious what this guy is doing, but do I want to go and call him on it or not? Because you know, maybe this is the only way that he can go and prevent worse things from happening is by uh, you know, base, basically being a sophist. Yeah, well, that happens on both sides of the, um, of the political yeah, fence, obviously. Yeah, needless, needless I, I'm say, a big but. fan of truth. I think um, I am a big fan of truth. Uh, I'm such a fan of truth that <laughs> uh, that I'm of, often willing to say, "Let's do it anyway," even though the consequences <laughs> are not good. And yet, when I see other people trying to achieve good consequences while not be not being as forthright, yeah, it's still so hard, this question of, "Let's see, does honesty require me to say something now, or could I just yeah, talk I honestly know. about some other subject yeah. on which I could be more fruitfully uh, engaged?" You. I hear you. Another issue that comes up in the road to serfdom that Hayek spends a lot of time on is the rule of law. It's a um, somewhat um, elastic concept, but not mm-hmm. exactly. Uh, how would you how would you describe the rule of law? And uh, again, how would you say we're doing in America in terms of the trend? Are we moving away mm-hmm. from it or toward it? Yeah, I mean, the rule of law is one of these things that Hayek talks a lot about. Where, uh, when critics, you know, he, you know, he was, so I remember, I remember you know, re- reading his critics in this old journal, the New Individualist Review, where when you listen literally to what Hayek says, it seems like, you know, if you had a rule saying that everyone had to re- wear an orange jumpsuit every day and that all men had to serve in the military from the ages of twelve to eighty, that would satisfy the rule of law because it's general and and, and, you know, right. and applies it? to everyone. There's no exceptions. It's There's not no, arbitrary. Yeah, not, not arbitrary. So, on the one hand, if you go and read Hayek literally, and you know, and he does say things that do imply this, then I'd say you know, the rule of law sounds terrible. What's so great about it? Why would anyone be interested in it? And yet, what I think that he's actually getting at is not so much the what, what he said as uh, what he meant to say. Yeah. <laughs> what he meant to say was that look, the rule of law is this code word for not only do we have regular laws, but the laws have to be reasonable ones that don't persecute people and that give people a reasonable amount of respect and a reasonable amount of latitude to, to live their lives. So, and again, I think this is, this is what uh, law professors uh, throughout you know, the, you know, the Anglo-American world often have in mind when they say you know, rule of law isn't just that the same law applies to everyone, but the law has to be reasonable. Now, again, again, a reasonable, well, Hard to define, you know, yeah. reasonable in the, in the sense of it's the kind of thing that Americans and Englishmen would have tolerated <laughs> throughout their grand freedom-loving history. Which, yeah. uh, you know, all right, uh, when you put it that way, see, you know, again, uh, maybe we should be, we might, ideally we'd be more precise, but if that's the flag, if we're going to wave the flag of, uh, you know, of stuff that reasonable, uh, you know, reasonable Englishmen would, would, would have been willing to go along with throughout the, the last few hundred years, all right, I guess that's not, uh, you could be a lot, you could do a lot worse. But of course, you know, the, the other way to, Direction that you worry about isn't just the reasonables and unreasonables. It is the arbitrariness. The mm-hmm. um, and I think what Hayek was was particularly worried about was the predictability. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, which, I mean, which makes it strange, though, in, in that you mentioned that you know how how big a role Nazi Germany played, and I would say Nazi Germany was a fairly predictable society in ter- in terms the of the of rules. They, yeah, you know, they they really did follow them. I, you know, so it reminds me actually, I was uh, you know I once, once had a very interesting lunch with a uh, an, elder, an elderly Polish man who had actually. Uh, be, you know, been sent to a Soviet slave labor camp uh, when Poland was invaded by the Russians, but his brother was actually captured by the Germans. So we had one brother growing up, you know, who, who's you know, basically, basically you know, coming of age in a uh, prison, uh, you know, prisoner or slave labor camp in Siberia. His brother was suffering in a German slave labor factory. Uh, for, amazingly, all six members of the family survived the war. And then I uh, so you know, but in the so you know, I asked him so all right, so which was worse? You know, the Russians or the Germans? He says the Germans were definitely worse. Why? Because they believed it and they followed the rules. Oh, interesting. He said, look, the Soviet people. He said, he said that when they got off their, their their train in Siberia, the Russian women wept for the children. The Russians felt felt very sorry for these poor Polish children who were being who had been pulled from their homes and were sent to Siberia. And he said, ordinary Russians did not not only did they not hate them, they pitied them, and they felt like they were in the same boat in some sense. And they and while they had these terrible rules, they were very willing to bend them. So the Germans they believed in their government, and they and even when they didn't believe in the government, they believed in the rules. Mm-hmm. 
So this, so, so, yeah. so well, I, I, it is odd that there be such an emphasis made on avoiding arbitrariness. Where and I say, look, when your rules are terrible, you need some arbitrariness right. to stay alive. Yeah, in the Soviet Union, uh, you know, it's uh, you know, we pretended to work and they pretended to pay us. There was, there was a lot of pretense. There was a lot of yes. That's, that's more post Stalin, though. <laughs> yeah, correct. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I, I'd say very much. Uh, you know, un, un, under Stalin, like, like the actual amount of work of labor that people did was tremendous. I mean, people did. You know, they put in like very long hours and uh, like they you know, like even if they even if the output wasn't wasn't good they 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 did really work like dogs under Stalin it was really only after Stalin died that uh, and and they empty and they didn't have, they largely emptied out the gulag by which i mean maybe 95% of millions of prisoners were sent home it's still a ton of prisoners yeah. in Siberia but the you know but basically the Gulag after Stalin was primarily for terrorizing critics of the government rather than for, rather than for terrorizing workers who, Slackers, who showed, up, yeah. showed up a few a few minutes late. Whereas under yeah. Stalin, it really was something to put the fear of God into every single person in the Soviet Union. I think or, that's put, the or wrong the fear, phrase. Fear, fear of Stalin. <laughs> yeah, I think Stalin was the, Stalin was God. Yeah, and, I think that's the wrong. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the reason that Hayek emphasizes the rule of law, and I, I want to use this as a way to segue into some of the the economics uh, that we haven't talked about. The, the reason. He was very interested in planning, and it's a it's a, a terrible misunderstanding of Hayek that he was against planning. He was against what he calls in the road to serfdom planning because by that he explicitly says he means government planning, mm-hmm. st- state top-down planning. Mm-hmm. Of course, individuals plan constantly, mm-hmm. and he when he talks about the virtues of the rule of law, he's talking about a, an environment of regulation and taxes – Regul- uh, contracts and expectations that allow individuals to use their knowledge, use their skills, the local, the the circumstances of time and place, to plan for the future, either for their business, for their mm-hmm. education, for their economic activity, for their travel, whatever it is, mm-hmm. and that is the the reason I think that he emphasizes the, the importance of the rule of law because when he's he's worrying about, it, he's not so much worrying about the unreasonable part of it. He's worrying about the arbitrary and mm-hmm. unpredictable part of it. Certainly, they're both relevant. Obviously, mm-hmm. really bad laws that are terribly predictable that apply to everyone mm-hmm. are um, – he, you're right. He wouldn't be in favor of it. He doesn't explicitly say that or say it very just well. Just explain why. I mean, we know that he's against them, but the theory <laughs> seems to commit him to saying that everyone who has to wear an orange jumpsuit is okay. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, and you have the feeling you say this is so arbitrary. Like, why is it arbitrary? Well, why orange? <laughs> yeah, it's not arbitrary particularly. You're, it's you're certainly right, um, but it would reduce your ability to plan the green outfit you were hoping mm-hmm. to wear. So I mm-hmm. think, in that sense, he might come up with some reasons against it. But I do think the um, I think it's an extremely important point. Mm-hmm. Even though we can talk about some reductio ad absurdums mm-hmm. uh, on either side, and I like your point about the virtues of arbitrary or imperfectly mm-hmm. enforced law when they're really bad and evil laws. But the fact is, is that to take risk and to invest and to innovate requires some uh, certainty about what the – your control over the enterprise and mm-hmm. the profits are going and, – and the losses are, are going to be. And I think um, – yeah, I mean, so certainty is too strong, but yeah, reasonable foreseeability, reasonable foreseeability, something like well, that. Well, there's no yeah. certainty, yes. but there's for, the certainty about what the political environment mm-hmm. is going to be like, the regulatory environment. Mm-hmm. So if you think mm-hmm. there's a chance that the tax rate on corporate profits is going to double mm-hmm. in the next five years, or you think there's a chance mm-hmm. that a VAT is going to be added, a value-added tax, or you think there's a chance that the government will just decide that you're not doing a good job, uh, say, with pollution or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have a very interesting case right now. We have uh, the, the oil spill in the Gulf, where BP, after meeting with the president, pledges a twenty billion dollar uh, uh, fund for for restitution. Why twenty billion? Why administered by uh, Kenneth Feinberg, who's a fine human being, as far as we can tell? Uh, that has that's nothing to do with the rule of law. It's very inconsistent mm-hmm. with the rule of law, and I I, I find it's somewhat alarming. Yeah, I agree. It's somewhat alarming. I mean, again, what I say is, is, you know, as alarming is not so much the lack of absolute certainty, but just the you know, like substantial increase in the probability that something like this will happen. Uh, this this is sort of an anti-Austrian point that I'll that I'll dig Go in because you know, Austrians often have, uh, you know, like you know, Austrians often have some philosophical objection to talking about probabilities, and I'd say, look, in the real world, probabilities are all that we have and all that we need. Right? So it's not that businesses need certainty about the rules, but you know, 
re- a reasonable amount of certainty. Sure. Is a very different story. So, and again, what I'd say is, you know, the concern in recent years is not so much that we've gone from zero chance of government doing these things to, uh, you know, some positive to some positive probability, but that we've gone from a lower probability to some some higher probability. So, you know, again, you know, my my ba- you know, basically, I'm in agreement with you, but it's just just on, you know, the best way to think about it is that you know the more likely that uh, there is to be some you know, strange decision that is made that, you've, that was, was unprecedented, the more likely that is to happen, the, you know, the worse it is for, uh, for businesses to be able to, make, you know, be able to make plans. But again, it's don't undersell businesses. Don't say the businesses can't figure out a way to make it, even if there's all sorts of political problems, they do. Right. Uh, of course, there comes a point yeah. where it gets a lot harder. Right. And, and, and generally, it's consumers who wind up paying the price rather than uh, businesses themselves, which is you know the, the way that we the way that we often think about uh, the effective regulation is like we're getting tough with this business. Really, we're getting tough with the with the people who buy, who buy the product, that product of that yeah. of that business. Uh, the business itself, if it's no longer profitable, they'll just they'll just go away. They'll just dissolve. disappear. Yeah. So, someone and someone else will sell the product at a price that remains profitable. And it and of course it it happens on the other side of the government involvement equation when the government decides to create a subsidy program for say clean mm-hmm. energy. Where its duration is uncertain, it might mm-hmm. last for two years and then it drops out of the budget. Mm-hmm. That certainly discourages people from fully taking advantage mm-hmm. of those kind of programs. Mm-hmm. One reason why you'd want to yes. let prices take their normal path. Mm-hmm. Of course, there's uncertainty about that too, right? Mm-hmm. If you'd ask, you know, the question would be: um, Is the finite nature of, of fossil fuel uh, going to encourage innovation today mm-hmm. to find alternatives? The answer is well, it depends. How fast it we use it up, and what the price path is, and mm-hmm. very uncertain. Obviously, mm-hmm. it's not. There's a lot of uncertainty on on all sides. Right. I mean, in a way, what I think is more important to think about is the you know the government creating a precedent, which is very hard to take back. So here, I think about uh, you know an example I like very much. Uh, you know, basically. Uh, around 1980, the the, uh, the the government of Iran under the Ayatollah started confiscating property of people who had fled the country. Then 20 years later, they went and tracked many of them down, sent them a letter saying, you can have it back, sorry. Right? And you can imagine how many people immediately got on the first plane back to Iran to go and, and, and reopen the shell of a business that had, that had disappeared 20 years earlier. Uh, not very many. Yeah. Right? You know, this is the kind of thing where... Uh, it, it, like there, there are many government policies where if you set a precedent, it forever changes the way that people think about things. And even if you really are b- bend over backwards and try to say, "Look, sorry, we were, we, were, we were wrong," yeah. uh, many things are, are many things are hard to take back. I mean, it's, you know, there there are some government you know government measures that are as hard to take back as a threat to kill yourself, where you make that threat once, and the people around you for the rest of their lives are like, "My God, he said that once. Will he ever do it? I don't know. I can't go back to the place I was at before he said that." Right. Uh, so. Uh- in the United States, are, are there some examples of uh, things that were unimaginable that are now imaginable that you think we've? we've I think I, I think actually, you know, TARP and the bail, and the bailouts. I think that's something that's really hard to take back. That that was just so much bigger than anything that happened before. It was for it was not for an industry that w- that was very explicitly regulated along these lines. It was it's very different from FDIC. I would say in that FDIC first they set up some rules. They have some processes. Here's something where it's an in, it's like something bad happened, and then. There, and then there was a big bailout, uh, you know, like which was which was in no the government had in no way pro- like promised to do this or even really suggested they would do it. It was just you know well, if something goes bad, will they? Who knows? Well, now now we do now we have a pretty good idea that if something like this happens, it will happen again. And even if uh, this were deemed to be a horrible problem, a horrible failure, and the next administration says we'll never do it again, it's pretty hard to go back. I mean, we may well, need to, we may need to wait ge- wait generations before you know like you know, you know basically, basically as long as long as I live. If the stock market goes down by twenty percent in, in over the course of a few weeks, I'm now going to be thinking that a, that a bailout is coming, right? And you know, no matter how many times government says they won't do it again, I'm going to think it's going to happen now. Well, in my recent podcast on the crisis, I I suggested that the past rescues of creditors, not so much bailouts, but the rescue mm-hmm. of creditors that really started in 1984, ironically, uh, certainly set expectations and affected behavior leading up to this crisis, mm-hmm. and certainly the Relentless bailout of of creditors, mm-hmm. other than Lehman Brothers, mm-hmm. uh, certainly the the rescue of, of Bear Stearns creditors, 
AIGs in particular. I mean, would you say that before it seemed like creditors got bailed out when they were, you know, as, as part of a, gov- of a government program that was... No, uh, so they weren't part of a yeah. government program. Yeah. That's the problem. So it was, it was you're arbitrary. Not just, so you're not just thinking about FDIC. Then. No, yeah. no. I'm talking about arbitrary government intervention to guarantee uh, uh, and, and to avoid losses to, to lenders. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, my favorite example that people always forget about, I talked about in the podcast, but I'll mention it again, is 1995. Mexico was trying to roll over mm-hmm. its debt. Mm-hmm. Uh, they couldn't raised the money. Mm-hmm. People were worried they were going to go bankrupt. And the government put in a $50 billion loan guarantee, the U.S. government, mm-hmm. rescuing not Mexico, although that's what it was called, but actually rescuing the people who Mexico owed money to mm-hmm. who had lent the money in the first place mm-hmm. and should have gotten it back. Mm-hmm. Instead, they got it all back. Uh, but it was called a success because mm-hmm. no taxpayer money was used in that guarantee. The guarantee was never invoked. But what it did is it sent a signal to the mm-hmm. lenders of the world, the large financial institutions, that they could continue to lend money and not mm-hmm. have as large a chance that they would have to go bankrupt if the money was lent mm-hmm. to a risky, too risky an enterprise. And I view this as a, a you know a terrible failure. And we've done it, as you said, mm-hmm. writ large, mm-hmm. uh, in 2008 onward. And I agree with you that it's going to be extremely difficult. Uh, in fact. Um, I interviewed Gary Stern, who wrote a book with Ron Feldman called Too Big to Fail, which was written in the um, in the 90s about how uh, – or early 2000s, excuse me, early 2000s, uh, that we were entering a world because of these past bailouts and rescues. Mm-hmm. We'd entered a world where people were going to be- behave recklessly. So uh, when I asked Gary Stern, well, but if you were in charge, if you had been – and he, was, he had worked for the Fed most of – a lot of his, his uh, career – if you'd been Ben Bernanke, would you have rescued those firms? And he said probably because it was a political problem, not so much an economic – maybe it was an – mm-hmm. I don't remember exactly what he said, but certainly said if I'd been in those in that, in those shoes, even though I knew what the costs were, I probably would have done the same thing. So he, his claim was we need new mechanisms so that you can avoid having to do that. Uh, it's not clear we can design those mechanisms. It's not clear that we have the political institutions, that the political forces that will help – Politicians do do those the right thing, and I, so I certainly agree with you that the uh, we've really, I mean, the tragedy is we have in many ways destroyed uh, the financial system that that is our really is a source of our productivity. Uh, you know, it's supposed to be how capital gets allocated to its highest valued use. Capital is scarce, and we're not allocating to its highest valued use, and we're going to pay a price for it. I mean, I, I actually remember, remember the Mexico bailout at the time where critics were dismissed for saying that there was going to be some long-run damage and you know, moral hazard, like, oh, what's this big moral hazard? Uh, there's a problem here right now, and you're telling yeah. us to worry about some ephemeral thing that will never happen. Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's you know always worth going back and seeing that people were dismissed <laughs> for worrying about things that turned out to be a big deal and saying, hey, well, you know, at least give them some credit, and maybe we should think about... Uh, you know, is there any way that we could get back to where we started? You know, like it, 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 it will be hard, right? You know, but, you know, but like I said, like you know, the government of Iran, the first step is, you know, saying sorry, we did, you, yeah, sorry, we, we made a that. mistake. Here's a little, here, you know, we shouldn't have done that. Here, you know, here here's you know, your worthless building back uh, in case you want it. Uh, would you care to come back and reopen a business here, twenty years after you've gotten on with lives and are probably you know doing very well in whatever country uh, you've, you've you've landed in? So, to close. The two books we've been talking about, uh, Eugene Richter's Pictures of the Socialistic Future, F.A. Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. You and I are both interested in the intellectual history of ideas, the history of socialism and capitalism, communism. Should a modern reader read these books? Is there, are there things to learn from them? Or are they just historical artifacts? I, th- I think I think they're, you know, the, both books are worth reading. Uh, I would actually tell people to read the Richter first because it's much first of all it's much easier to read, and second of all, you know, Richter is much more impressive because he said stuff was going to happen before it happened. So you read it and you say, "Wow, this guy actually knew something," right? Hay- you know, Hayek, on the other hand, is talking about really bad things that he saw, which is useful and good to know. But it's not as impressive be- uh, to go and, and point to things that are actually bad r- right around you and say, hey, look, that, you know, that's bad over there. And then in terms of Hayek's predictions, I think we were talking about this a little bit before, before the podcast. Uh, but you know, in, terms, in terms of his predictions, you, know, you, could, you, know, like, you could either say, look, Hayek was wrong because we didn't end up in totalitarianism. Or we could go and say what Hayek said, which is we didn't because we listened to me or we listened right. to people like me. Right. Uh, so, you know, you know, so and I would say you know, out, of, out of Hayek's books, Road to Serfdom, uh, you know, may be my favorite one of his books.
Uh, overall, I'm not a huge hike fan, but this this is one that I I could definitely see myself rereading. You're not a huge hike fan, bro. Why did I invite you to an econ talk? This is gonna this proves once and for all that I'm a very fair host of the show. I, you are so fair, <laughs> Russ. I would I would I find it interesting that. The Road to Serfdom Serfdom is his most famous book. Now, part of the reason that's true is um, because of the Reader's Digest condensed version Mm -hmm. that came out. There's a cartoon version. We'll put up some links to those if we can. Um, But it's not – it's by far for me not his – not my favorite book of Hayek. My favorite book of Hayek is The Fatal Conceit, which I think is a phenomenal book. It's hard to read. It's short. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's still hard to read, uh, and, mm-hmm. and The Road to Serfdom is also hard to read. Mm-hmm. He doesn't give a lot of examples. He doesn't give a lot of metaphors. He doesn't he, – he's a – he actually writes fairly well, but he does not write concretely. And so for a modern mm-hmm. reader, he's very difficult. In that sense, mm-hmm. I agree the Richter is a better book. Yes, um, and incidentally, if you're tempted to go and blame uh, Hayek's origin, uh, as, uh, or origins in the German-speaking world, <laughs> remember Richter is also from the yes. German-speaking world <laughs> and writes extremely well, concisely. Yeah, uh, yes. well, lively, yes, I would yes, say. Lively. I would go further. I'd say it's, it's yes. loose and lively. Uh, if only Hayek had written a novel, we, we probably could have enjoyed it. But uh, So I, I would recommend um, uh, The Fatal Conceit over The Road to Serfdom, but The Road to Serfdom is, is definitely worth reading. Uh, for the in, for the economics and incentives that are embedded in it, mm-hmm. they don't jump out at you. He was writing a political tract for his day at a time when he was very fearful of the direction of the world was going. He certainly was right about the direction. England certainly went in a very extreme direction after the war, certainly part of the intellectual tradition of Germany that had led to mm-hmm. Nazism that, that mm-hmm. Hayek saw as a threat. Uh, I think that the single most important part of that book is the recognition that uh, communism and and fascism are the same, and so you know they're both about top down mm-hmm. centralized planning, um, and have common intellectual roots, and have common intellectual roots. Which pointing that in out in Germany, <laughs> in Germany, which is extremely <laughs> extremely important. He also, by the way, likes to point out that um, that uh, there were some English roots to the worst parts of the Nazi program, which is yes. another. <laughs> it's a little dig in at the, at the British. I think I'm not quite sure why he threw that in, but. Maybe because it's true. <laughs> yeah, he, he picks on Carlyle, somebody yeah. we like to pick on. Yeah, here. But, uh, you know, Chamber, Chamberlain, you know, the, the direct influence, uh, not, not Neville Chamberlain, the but, other Chamberlain yeah, uh, on, on, on Hitler. Uh, was it W H? Yes. Which I forget yes. what it's. The H is Houston. I can't remember mm-hmm. the W. It might be William. I'm not mm-hmm. sure. But he and Carlyle. Um, so that yeah, that there was an influence on Hitler from from the British that that made it worse. Um, so anything in closing? Anything else you'd like to say about socialism, Hayek, Richter? Yeah, I think the most interesting thing for me about the history of socialism is understanding that the really bad things didn't happen because a group of wonderful altruistic men ha- ha- happened to be either corrupted or replaced or, 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 or somehow uh, their, their movement was taken away from them. You know, the, re- the real history of socialism is more like this. The purists, the true believers, they're the ones who became the true monsters. And the people that we now think of as social democrats, they're the descendants of the sellouts. They're the descendants of the ones that the founders of their party w- would be horrified by because they compromised. They admitted that capitalism was a lot better than the founders of the movement could, could ever have tolerated. And then they, then they, they gradually made peace with, it, with, peace with their system. So you know, like if you look, look, you look in 1960 and you were to say, you know, who are the true descendants of the 19th century German Social Democratic, Democratic Party? Are they the people ruling East Germany? Or are they the Social Democrats who are trying to reinvent themselves and gain power in West Germany? And say, look, it is the East Germans who were, who were, the, who were the legitimate children. They were the ones who continued to believe in complete state management of the economy and were willing to do whatever it took in order to make keep that dream alive. In the West, on the other hand, there were moderates who, when they realized they would have to kill a lot of people in order to be true to socialism, said, all right, well, then let's not do socialism so much because killing people is bad, even if Karl Marx said it would be okay as part of the whole process. My guest today has been Brian Kaplan. Brian, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks so much for having me, Russ. It's always a pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.